the Payne Report. It is the first Friday of the month, and the Honorable Congressman Donald Payne is with us to, to tell us all the things that are going on in Washington to discuss hip-hop, and more recently, to discuss some very important matters in terms of health and what can be done, not just individually, but nationwide. Well, so, well, well also, don't you want to introduce me? I'm, I'm oh, you're you know, right. Here. I am. And, you, I, I and know, you're right here, I know too. not the congressman. Oh, yeah. And I'm, 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 I'm just all, and I'm I'm just all like here. the congressman's here. We got a wonderful guest that's here. And Mr. And I, Ed Riley, my I'm, bad. And I know I'm not as sharp as the congressman right now. Oh, okay, because yeah. most of you are on radio, so you don't see that the congressman is dressed up in a nice, like one of those, like, James Bond Casino that's Royale gets right. it. Right? That's, so, that's like, he's getting ready to hit the, uh, the, the Monte Carlo gambling <laughs> spots, that's right? A little, little Friday evening wear. That's absolutely right. <laughs> <laughs> so we have, we have Ed Riley here as well, the yeah. creator of All Politics All Local. And we also have a big shout-out for our intern, Michael, because yeah. Michael uh, has been doing some really good stuff, and you're going to be hearing a lot more from him in the future. Yeah, so, that's right. That's right. So you, you know, the only bad thing about Michael being here now is that... Like, since we're going to be streaming live, I can't eat potato chips. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, no, yeah. and that's probably a good thing. <laughs> probably a good thing. Mess around, mess around, get the congressman in trouble with his wife. Yeah, be like, you. see, didn't I tell you? Right, see? right, right. Mm -hmm. So we have a special guest uh, today, Congressman Payne. So this is your report. This is the Payne report. And uh, so we are, every uh, every week, um, or every time now, like you, you often have very special themes. Uh, more recently, there's been a theme that's been dear to you uh, when talking about health. Uh, talk to us about your guests, about your guest, and some of the issues that you really are promoting for the, for really the good of the community. Well, thank you, uh, John and, and Ed. It's good to be back. Uh, first of the month, it gets here quick. For I tell it you, does. Friday, I, I blink, <laughs> and here we are again. But. Um, you know, I'm really delighted tonight to, um, and Ed, I want to thank you for coming up with the idea and being thoughtful in reference to, uh, you know, I kind of in and out on my story over the course of time, you know, I'm, the things I've, challenges I've had right. uh, medically, and uh, you just said, well, why don't we just, you know, get down to it? And so here we are. And so I, um, you know, over the course of the last, four years have had some um, challenges um, with diabetes and what has happened um, after 20 years of um, being non-compliant and not doing the things that I needed to do it you know it, it eventually catches up with you and so I've been uh, in you know a pretty tough battle off and on uh, trying to um, hold this disease um, from taking over um, you know my, my whole life but um, we, uh, you know, had done some work uh, in terms of um, diabetes. And, you know, um, there was a, a, a time where, uh, you know, I've had some issues with foot wounds that right. have had a hard time healing. And, um, you know, naturally, you know, I became concerned about uh, my, my, my toes and my feet and, you know, the potential of amputations. Uh, thank God, knock on wood, that it never uh, got that far. I have, I have really, really good doctors, and I'll talk about that later. Right. But um, <clears throat> so I started getting interested in, in the whole issue around um, amputations. And right around that time, um, there was a, um, a forum, a roundtable uh, on, on Capitol Hill around this issue. Uh, I had met some people that were into um, uh, vascular surgery, uh, peripheral artery disease, and a group that I met in Washington of doctors that work in that field. Mm. And um, what was interesting is, you know, I started talking about my story and what I've been through and what I was going through, and I, I mentioned the um, the really great work that they had been doing in Cuba, and and. You know, you would think I was talking Russian, because mm. mm. none of none of these doctors flinched. Right. Because you're like the great work they're doing it in Cuba, and they're like, "Cuba, Q -Q right? Cuba." -what? So I was like, you know, none of you know of this work, right? And they're like, "No." So what I did was I um, 
I worked out leading a trip to Cuba with uh, several doctors. Now, fast forward into this uh, round table in Washington, D.C., I had the great fortune of having a uh, young man who uh, was a doctor and had been from New Jersey, and um, Doc will probably have to tell me how he ended up in my office, but he did with mm. one of his patients mm. that had had both of her, both legs, Doc? Correct. Both, both legs, legs amputated. But this patient had not met uh, Dr. Um, Faccaretti until it was too late. Mm -hmm. Because um, based on the work that he had done, he probably could have helped her. Mm -hmm. But um, she came in and spoke to me about, even though it was too far gone for her, the work that this young man had done. And so, you know, um, so we're in my office, we're talking, and he's, you know, Bang, well, I'm from Jersey, so you know, I'm smiling. Right. Bang, I went to Rutgers, I got a bigger grin. Bang, right. I was in Newark. <laughs> so right. you know, like, I'm putting my arm around right. him. Bang, you know, and then he talks about going to Camden and understanding, you know, the need mm. uh, there. And then at some point in time, saying, you know what? And this is the thing that, that I appreciate about him most. He in his mind, he said, if I'm really going to be about this, then I need to go where the need is greatest. And he packed up and moved to Mississippi. Wow. I mean, you know. Now, the, why, why Mississippi? The, the commitment. Is well, the need greatest well, in Mississippi? Oh, well, he'll, he'll get into that. I let heard me, you mention that last week. Yeah, but That's let me, why we want to carry this on. But let me, let me, let me uh, without further ado, let me just um, uh, uh, give you his introduction. Dr. Uh, Faluso, Faluso, Fa, see now I'm gonna mess it up. I'm all nervous. Faluso <laughs> Faccaretti, um, he uh, has a a, a practice um, in Mississippi, um, the endovascular specialist, um, and he works for um, Fusion Vascular Center in Cleveland, Mississippi. Uh, he was educated at Rutgers and uh, Robert Wood Johnson here in New Jersey, and. Um, he received uh, his degree from uh, UMDNJ Robert Wood Johnson Medical School in Camden, New Jersey. He is currently a, C a CEO and endovascular specialist in Fusion Vascular Center in Cleveland, Mississippi. Mm -hmm. He is an expert in preventive cardiovascular management and has advanced technical skills in preventing amputations. Wow. He has contributed to the science communities through many articles and journals that he's published. He is a big advocate for addressing health disparities in underserved communities. And that is, is it epitomizes who he is. Mm. This brother said, you know what? If I'm really gonna be about it, I gotta go where the need is greatest. And I mean, who relocates to Mississippi? Right. I mean, this this uh, with his education and his background, right. he can go anywhere in the world. Right. And get paid you know five what? times as much. But you know what? He went where the need was greatest. And so, you know, I believe in this young man. Uh, uh, what I've learned from him in the last year has changed my life. Mm. And we have gotten together, and we are going to do some big things. We are going to change we're going to we're going to stem the tide of amputations in this country. Wow. And it started it's starting with us as a movement. But we have some really great friends that are that are we're nephrologists and and podiatrists that that are down with us, but I mean this is a true movement. So without further ado, I want you to hear from the man himself, Dr. Faccaretti. All right. Wow. Uh, good afternoon. Good evening, actually. Um, it's afternoon here, but uh, evening in D.C. Um, Congressman Payne Jr., uh, Mr. Ed Riley, uh, John, and the intern. Uh, what's your name? I'm sorry. Michael. Uh, Michael. Uh, Michael. Michael. Uh, <laughs> Welcome, Doc. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you for having me as a guest on your esteemed show. Um, thank you for those effusive praises and, and, and that kind words, uh, Congressman Payne Jr. Um, those are invaluable, and I really appreciate um, your collaboration on speaking 
about uh, the most prevalent, debilitating, costly, and deadly pandemic that most people in America, and especially most of your listeners today, have never heard about, which is perforational disease. So thank you very much for that introduction. Absolutely. So um, talk a little about um, your experience and um, what you've been able to do uh, since your arrival in Mississippi. And, and especially you. what the name of the disease is, because you said sure, it. Sure, and I, let, 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 Let's start there. Um, we're talking about um, a, a, a disease that affects about 20 million uh, Americans, but the awareness of the disease is less than 15%. 20 million? Uh, it, yes, 20 million Americans. It's called peripheral artery disease, and if you want me to spell that, I can as well. The short acronym for it is PAD, peripheral artery disease. Um, it's basically the buildup of plaque and cholesterol called atherosclerosis, and you've heard about this because you've heard of patients who've had heart attacks, right? right? Coronary artery disease. Well, this is the version of the same pathology that occurs in the heart that actually affects your lower limbs and upper limbs, and when it narrows the blood vessel to your legs and your feet, um, you lose good oxygenated blood going to those affected areas, and if it's not caught on time, then you have patients who develop pain, uh, non-healing wounds, ulcers, some numbness, weakness, uh, coldness in their feet, sores, um, hair loss, and slower growth of their no uh, toenails. And most of them actually initially do not recognize these symptoms. And just like cancer, uh, if it's not caught on time, and if it progresses to a later stage, they develop what we call gangrene of their feet, which is end stage. You're told it's black and dark, and they get amputated. Unfortunately, unfortunately, 90% of those amputations could have been prevented. 90%. Now, now when you talk about these diseases, isn't that just, I mean, I would just, isn't that just diabetes? Is that something well, separate? Not, not, just, not, not just diabetes. Well, diabetes is, uh, uh, diabetes is one of the compli one of the complications of diabetes is peripheral arterial disease, poor circulation to the limbs. Mm -hmm. But what are the risk factors for peripheral arterial disease? I think that's what, we, that's why I describe atherosclerosis, the blood <laughs> black and cholesterol. As we get older, anyone over the age of, of you know, of, of 50, for instance, um, your chances of developing plaque in your lower extremities or in your heart or in the blood vessels going to your brain, which, are, which causes strokes, that, that chance uh, and those odds are actually heightened, they're increased. If you do have high blood pressure, you have high cholesterol, if you have a family history of either peripheral arterial disease or atherosclerosis period, your chances are increased. If you're a smoker or exposed to nicotine, so people who vape, who chew, who dip, tobacco products, um, you accelerate your chances of building up atherosclerosis by twofold. I, I just um, want you to say, know that everybody in this room right now is sweating except for Michael. <laughs> well, I'm not done. Well, wait, wait, wait till I'm done. Okay, we sweat now. I'm just letting you know. If you are an African American, uh, your check. chances of developing peripheral arterial disease is actually two times, and if you have diabetes, it's four times. Diabetes itself increases your ch odds of developing peripheral arterial disease um, and, and, and accelerating the, the rate in which plaque builds up um, by fourfold, uh, meaning... Wow! You know, yeah, sir. It's just estimated that one out of three people with diabetes 50 years of age or older has peripheral arterial disease, mm. yet millions of people with diabetes don't realize that they're at risk of losing, losing their limbs until it's too late mm. because it's a silent killer. It appears silently. It's progressive. Uh, most of the symptoms <coughs> come on set late on or if you do not see a specialist who understands the signs and the symptoms or if you're not told about these, then you just don't know. It's lack of awareness. That's the, that's the answer. And uh, we have a, a situation now where uh, we have 30 million Americans that currently live with diabetes and 84 million who live with pre-diabetes, which is an early stage of diabetes. So the greatest risk to our healthcare system is actually diabetes and obesity as we speak today. So is, is, it, is the solution just to, because uh, I've been trying, 
I'm, I feel guilty. I feel like I've just been called out on so many different levels. And I'm like, I've been trying to go to the gym. I've been trying to eat better. Like, I mean, I don't know. I'll, I'm, I'm just feeling kind of exposed right now. Yeah, it, but it, but it is good. It, 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 you you get informed. You're not exposed. You get informed so you can be transformed. That's what mm. I tell me. And so the that, question that, I the question I got, Doc, is, is yes, what do we do to prevent it, right? right. Because if, so, if we right. if we got right. all those, you know, I mean, what you just mentioned, right? So so right. first off, we're black. Second of right. all, we got somebody in our family who's been predisposed to all those right. symptoms. And that's everybody. Pressure, everybody right? everybody you know? in everybody's family who's black got high blood pressure, right. Right. got diabetes. There's somebody in their family that got them, they got all of them. Right. I love this. I love this. I love this discussion. All right, so let, let's start here. Number one, we have a couple of things to do. One, we have to realize that um, majority of the patients who are affected with peripheral arterial disease um, live in areas whereby social, uh, health disparities currently exist. And when I say that, race comes into play. So it's not just African Americans that are Hispanic and also Native Americans. Uh, income, low socioeconomic status. People who are Medicare and Medicaid uninsured are more likely to have peripheral arterial disease, meaning that they lack access to quality care versus wow. access to care, right? Two different things. Those are two different things I'll, that I'll come to later. You said on. access to care and access to quality yeah, care? Access are to quality care, yeah. Two yeah. different things. I, yeah, and I'll explain that later, but what I tell my patients is that your first point of contact, meaning any of you in that room, your first point of contact in the medical field will determine if you live or if you die or if you lose your limbs. Wait, example, you, your first point of contact? What does right, that mean? Let, let, let me give you an example. If you were to walk into a room as a 70-year-old African-American female with history of hypertension, you've had a stroke, you've had heart disease, and you walk in and you see a nurse practitioner or a physician and you tell them that you've had leg or hip pain or that your feet kind of is turning a different color, right? And what they tell you is that, you know what, you're 70, it's arthritis, here's arthritis, arthritis medicines, go home, come back in a month. But you don't make it a month. Versus, versus I'm giving you the, that access to care. Oh, you went okay. to see a doctor and they, they diagnosed you with arthritis and they gave you arthritis medicines or they told you you had gout. Well, as we say down here in the South, you had the couch. All right? <laughs> now, if I, if I take you to another physician or a nurse practitioner or a family care provider with similar story, you're 70 years old, let, let, let's change the, the narrative. You are, you have good insurance, you have Blue Cross Blue Shield or someone else, right? And you tell them that you have um, had leg symptoms and, and you tell them that it's achy, burning, you have a family history of diabetes, you've never been diagnosed with diabetes, you walk into the office and they take off your socks and they see a black toe. Mm. And the next thing they tell you is, no, we need to do an ultrasound of your legs or we need to assess the arteries in your legs to see if you have poor circulation. As soon as they diagnose that you have a blocked artery in your legs, they send you to a vascular specialist and within 90 minutes, that artery is unclogged and you're home shortly thereafter and that toe now restores has good coloration and in two years you still have your toes and your feet and that other person who went to and uh, was misdiagnosed with arthritis loses their legs wow. because they got amputated both of you had access to care but one of you had access to quality care one of us doctors knew what they were talking about yes sir absolutely one of us had a doctor like you and so, well, well there, and there are many others. There, there, there are many, not, not to discredit others, but there are many others. But the challenge here is that are doctors equipped and are they informed to know what the diagnosis is? We found out through research studies that a lot of doctors who treat peripheral arterial disease, less than 20% of doctors in the community in general, so all your doctors, you can name any type of doctor, less than 20% actually know how to assess a patient who has all these signs and symptoms of peripheral arterial disease. Wait, wait, let, let's, let, let me, let me. It's not well taught in medical schools. It's not well taught in their training programs. And the awareness is not heightened to state that the U.S. Preventative Service Task Force has recommended some implement some tools that a doctor can implement to diagnose patients who are considered at risk for peripheral arterial disease. All these things are a factor in why 
this pandemic has grown to where it is today. Wow. So what you're telling me is that doctors spend thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars on med school. They are the most best trained and educated people probably in the country, and we don't know one of the most common diseases in the United States. Well, you didn't. You probably didn't know how prevalent this disease was. No, I'm a teacher. I ain't go to med school. Well, well, that's why. So it's it's not just because physicians don't know how prevalent peripheral arteries. It's 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 a subset of a bigger problem mm. that doctors misdiagnose for other things. We misdiagnose it for arthritis, for gout, for old age. We quote that you have neuropathy, nerve disturbances. But no one has actually diagnosed it for what it truly is, which is mm. poor circulation. And the reason being that most of these patients were never accurately or adequately screened on time when their symptoms first presented. And most of them actually have silent symptoms. We'll consider them asymptomatic. That's the word they use in medicine, meaning that you just walk for years with diabetes, right. your circulation, uh, your, 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 your feet are not inspected routinely. Mm. Um, you have a, you've had heart event, and the fact that you've had a heart event, doctors should recognize that you can have a leg event or you can have a stroke. I right. do like and the way you say heart event, because right. it seems like right. there's a party. You had a heart, you had a party no, in your heart. I know, I know, I, I try to simplify. You know, you got the sugar. People have diabetes, you got the sugar. You need to make sure that that sugar has not turned into a clogged pipe if that's going to your leg or you get leg attacks. If, you, if it clogs up in your heart, you get a heart attack. If it clogs up in your neck, you get a stroke. stroke. Yeah, so that's the analogy. The uh -huh. question being, how many people know how to diagnose all those things? Most doctors know how to diagnose strokes or heart attacks, diabetes, and cancer. But most people do not know how to diagnose peripheral arterial disease, despite the fact that it is more prevalent than, any, uh, than all those except for diabetes. It's more prevalent than cancers wow. and everything else and the heart attacks. And it is more costly than diabetes, cancers combined. Wow. It's Yes, it costs our healthcare uh, system over two, you know, close to four hundred billion dollars. Hold on, you said wait, wait, time out. You said that peripheral peripheral artery disease. Correct, DAD. Correct. Peripheral artery disease correct. is more prevalent than diabetes and heart no, attack. No, no, no. no. Oh, everything. Than, than than heart attacks and cancer. Heart attacks and cancer. Combined. Everything combined. Right. Correct. More than heart attacks yeah. and cancer. Combined. Correct. And more costly. <clears throat> but the awareness for it is, is less than ALS, for instance, which affects, you know, uh, you, you can look it up how much people have ALS, but you've heard of the bucket right. challenge. Right. You've heard of, right. But most people are just not aware as to what the signs and symptoms of this and how to screen these patients. And that's why the alliance and, and the discussion we have with Congressman Payne in September was altering to the lives of those people who are mainly affected by this. Many of these PAD-related uh, amputations are preventable if aggressively screened. So, and so we talk. So we talked a lot about lack of information, right? Correct. And how to how to inform people. I, like there are two questions. One would be how do we inform more, and the second one, which we really should get into, is what do we do when we know? Right. How do we prevent? Well, let me let me uh, let me uh, jump in here for a minute. Um, I think that's where uh, Dr. Faccaretti, um has really helped me in going down uh, understanding that um, we need to attack this the same way that breast cancer was attacked. Uh, every woman knows to get a mammogram, right? Uh, and we have to bring that same type of awareness around around this uh, uh, peripheral artery disease. Doctors should know, okay, if these symptoms are happening, I need to check for PAD. Mm. And, 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 and if I'm not mistaken, Doc, you're saying that's where we are not yet, right? Right, so we're not there yet because there are flaws in the bodies that regulate the Preve Clinical Preventative Service. It's called the U.S. Preventative Service Task Force, which was founded by Congress in the 80s. 
and the goal of that task force is to improve the health of all Americans by making evidence-based recommendations about clinical preventative services. So cancer is a silent killer. We know that, right? Most people don't have symptoms when they have cancer. Mm -hmm. But you get your colonoscopies, right? You get your mammograms. Uh, women get their pap smears, their uh, prostate exams. There are things that have to be checked so that we can catch them on time. Well, like there was a lot of education about, around prostate, and prostate and, exams. And there was awareness. And now it's it's actually spread to our NFL games, our baseball games. You see it when you go to the, the banks. Banks are have it on their you know on their ATMs, airplanes. The napkins on the airplane I flew over for a couple of months ago had breast cancer awareness. So there are just things that are out there, and they've done a great job with cancer. We now need to do that with peripheral arterial disease, and that's why we went to Congressman Payne about this issue and this topic. Because despite the fact that this disease affects 20 million Americans, 200,000 Americans every year get amputated because of this disease. Yeah. Once you undergo an amputation... I'm sorry, what was that number? 200,000. Wait, 200,000 people yes, have amputations? Lose their, limbs, lose their limbs because of, of peripheral arterial disease. 200,000? 200,000 every and, year. And, yes. Doc, you're saying this is actually and, preventable. And, and, and it gets worse. It gets worse. 90% of, of, of those amputations could be prevented. Wow. Majority of these amputations occur in regions, prim primarily where there are a lot of African Americans have low socioeconomic status. So, for instance, wow. Mississippi. Mississippi is the epicenter of TAV and amputations. Um, if you look at the numbers, the, 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 the amputation rates in Mississippi are about 17 times higher than what you'll see in Connecticut uh, or in, in, in your nice counties in New Jersey, right? I mean, there are certain areas, I'm sure, on Newark, Jersey City, Camden. I mean, we can go on and on. Where Wherever we live. Any any city, exactly. any hood. I mean, Y'all do the math, but if you live in Mississippi, Alabama, West, uh, Louis, uh, Kentucky, um, Arkansas, Georgia, Tennessee, um, there are certain areas, and, and where you're poor, West Virginia, your amputation rates are higher because your burden of disease, diabetes, cardiovascular diseases, um, you know, smoking, um, lack of access to quality care, um, Medicaid, uninsured patients, right, where they have the lowest number of physicians per capita. That's, that, that's the map. So that's, we call that the amputation lottery. Your chances of wow. getting amputated are higher in these regions. And that's why I came here. Mississippi has a 37% African-American population. That's next to D.C., right? So, Wait, the state is 37% African-American? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Here in Mississippi. It's chocolate it's most, state. It's, mostly, it's, the, it's the most... The, uh, the largest population of African Americans in the country. Wow! And majority of these patients live here in the Mississippi Delta, right. where no, the doctors that. do not look like me, right, or you. Oh. And and majority of these patients do go to see pay doctors when they have end stage or when they have symptoms of poor circulation. And some of them are just told that you need to lose your limb, because that is the first answer that most of these doctors have given to. Not only these patients, but their parents and their grandparents, and that has been the La last practice of amputations. Last for month, years. Congressman Payne called it civil war medicine. They use civil war medicine on. It. Of all the forms of inequality, injustice in healthcare is the most shocking and inhumane. Dr. Mm. Martin Luther King said that in 1960 wow. in Chicago, and that has not changed. That's changed at all. So, yeah, so, that's so, so all. no, Doc, give them the statistics. Well, uh, uh, enlighten them on, on, on how serious and critical the uh, ability for these people to get the proper health care because of the number of patients per doctors in Mississippi. This is striking. Yes, how many yes, cardiologists are there? So, so in terms of vascular specialists who do, who do what, we, what I do in terms of trying to restore circulation in these patients before they get amputated, before I came here to where I'm, or the, the center, basically the, the epicenter, um, there were no doctors who did the procedures which are minimally invasive, meaning that I can go in and into an artery and unclog an, uh, an artery just like a plumber would unclog a clog pipe in your kitchen sink, right? And and I these these doctors did not exist before I got here. They were surgeons, but they were not vascular specialists or limb salvage specialists. Um, 
before I got here, they did about uh, 60 amputations at the hospital where I currently um, have privileges every year. And um, basically four and a half years into getting here, we've decreased that by 88%. Um, and we published that in a, in a major journal. So we went from 60 a year to about five to six amputations a year. Uh, majority of these patients being African American, by the way. And that's when you uh, got to the hospital? That's, yeah, when I got to the hospital. So before I got here, those numbers were very high. And they're still high in other surrounding hospitals where I have no access. And so my voice and my why and my campaign here wow. has to be to, to go out and reach out to our faith based community, right. churches, talk to them about this is what's going on, y'all, in our community speak truth to power on it, tell them what the signs and the symptoms are. If you're told you've had the gouch, if you've been told you've the had gouch. It, right? the gouch, right? you got to yeah. use the gouch, not the gouch, the gouch. <laughs> <laughs> wow. If you told them you've had arthritis, or if you told them like, your skin, what your skin should look like and what the uh, skin should not look like, or if you've been told you've had diabetes, you've been told that you've had heart attacks or strokes, you need to get screened. Tell, take off your socks. We I actually go out and we do campaigns where we screen these patients. Uh, we bring in, you know, faith-based alliances and industry alliances to come and help us screen. And in doing so, we've 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 forged this this voice and this campaign now, where uh, everyone now knows who to go to for quality care when it comes to poor circulation. And and and, and let me just say that uh, you know my 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 role in this is to meet someone like Dr. Faccaretti, understand what he's been able to accomplish uh, in his in his bellywick and give him a national platform, which is what I'm trying to do. Is it that that is my obligation. I I have committed myself and I don't know how we're gonna do it, but I am um, I am assigned, I, I am going to reduce the number of unnecessary amputations in this country. And we're going to help you. Mm, you have, absolutely. You have. You have. And, and can I, can I tell, tell, tell our audience how Dr. Congressman Payne Jr. has gotten involved? That we, we, we spoke to him about the need for the evil of unnecessary amputation to, to, to stop due to lack of you know, uh, lack of early screening and failure to provide early treatment of at-risk patients and lack of a multidisciplinary approach, meaning working with other doctors in outlying areas, primary care doctors, and, and trying to have the bodies that regulate those doctors to encourage and incentivize them to screen these patients yeah. who are at risk. And we, we went to him and we said that we need to form a, a, a group um, which is basically an a intergovernmental group where we can implement broad policies and, and talk about raising awareness of, of this pandemic. And we wanted a PAD caucus on the Hill. And I'm, I'm, I'm just proud to say that, um, you know, Congressman Payne um, made that uh, uh, just his primary focus. And this year that was established. Mm. And the goal of the PAD caucus and the mission um, is to basically to educate our congressional, both bipartisan and bicameral effort uh, uh, staffers and communities about PAD while supporting legislative activities to help improve uh, awareness and PAD research and education and treatment and the goal of preventing non-traumatic and, and, and unnecessary amputations due to PAD and other related diseases, namely diabetes and other diseases that I've mentioned. Kidney disease is another one as well. And so there are certain initiatives that we want we want the U.S. Preventive Service Task Force to review their their statement on screening for PAD at-risk patients, because their statement on that, especially regarding African Americans, is sad. What would it do? Like, what what is it right now, and what would ch how would changing I, help? Okay, so what it is right now, and I need to just get, basically give you guys an example. There are recommendations that they give A or B ratings when it comes to uh, influences of screening services through full coverage of either Medicare providing uh, payments to the, for screening or a fidelity of the family practice and internal medicine community that this is the right thing to do. So if someone has a lump in their breast or a family history of breast cancer, what do they recommend? 
you get a mammogram or you get screened, right? right? right. So here, here's what we are, we are we're, 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 we're advocating. If someone is over the age of 50 or you've had diabetes, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, and exposure to nicotine at some point, right? So smoking, dipping, chewing, or you have a family history of arthrosclerosis, or you're over, you know, you've had kidney disease. We want them to consider those patients at risk and have their doctors do procedures where they can assess the arteries in their limbs, mm. in their legs, and then screen these patients early on before their symptoms progress. Right? And That's all we're asking for. And that would get insurance to cover it? Like, would changing it mean that... Well, yes, yes. That would, that would get Medicare to provide payment to these doctors when they we should screen for it. you have to incentivize behavior guys you know right, right? right. That's, it, it, it makes sense that's how you're going to get a lot of doctors to do this because a lot of them are just lack the knowledge and the awareness and the information so incentivize them to screen these patients because you're going to save these dollars the 250 billion dollars right. that are being lost right. and that's year. that's the key i mean that's you know the key. The, 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 we all win I mean, the, 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 the incentive, the incentive the is the money that the insurance companies are not going to pay out for right. if these people are screened and have the preventive maintenance done to their arteries prior to down the road having their foot lopped off. Right. Wow. Right. So, I mean, right. that's that's all we're, we're saying. Put it in the same category as a mammogram, a colonoscopy. It's just certain things. When you see certain symptoms, you screen for this. Right, right. It's very now simple. Can, yeah, now can mm -hmm. I read you their statement? But before I read their statement, I want you to note African Americans are the least studied group in all research studies. Right. I don't know if you're aware wow. of this. And, and Hispanics. Out of all the what we call cardiovascular trials that have come out to date, less than 5% include African Americans, right? Less than 5%, despite the fact that we carry the majority of the burden of cardiovascular diseases that will happen until the year 2035, 2045, based on American Heart Association numbers, the CDC numbers, everyone has come out and said, you need to you just watch out in, this, in these populations. Right. Now, here is your statement. Their statement is that there is insufficient evidence. Wow. To assess, now, let me finish. Insufficient evidence to assess the balance of benefit versus harm, and we're uncertain that the prevalence of PAD, despite it being disproportionately higher among racial ethnic minorities and low socioeconomic populations, we note that this statement will, could discourage testing and perpetuate disparities in treatment and outcomes. We recognize these well-established disparities in care. However, however, let me finish. However, the evidence on screening and treatment in these groups is currently lacking. And the U.S. Preventive Service Task Force was unable to determine the overall balance of benefits and harms. We need future research. Wow. Future research should include diverse populations and report their outcomes before we change our recommendation. Now, so we're not going to change our recommendation, even though we know they're disproportionately affect, affected. Makes you want to holler and throw up yeah, both my hands. No, no, no. Tell me if you're not upset at that statement. I, you know, that's, that's what pisses me off every day. Wow, we have crazy. we have paid the price. If wow. you look at the health disparities that have plagued African Americans up till today in all these regions, you now want them to now enroll them in research to determine if you're going to lose your limbs, despite the fact that 200,000 people are losing their limbs every year. And once your limb is lost, your rate of death increases by 50 to 80 percent wow. in the next three to five years. Right. They're dead. Most of them are dead by wow. then. So wow. what research are you researching when most of them are gone? Right. Exactly. Like the, you. right. You don't have a you don't have a pool. <laughs> It's what so I call. That, that, that's why Martin, Dr. Martin Luther King's statement was very powerful because the, uh, you know, the most shocking and inhumane is is, is, is health injustices. It's an injustice. It's, it's like, criminal. It's like after the fact. Wow. Right. It's after the fact. You know, right. I mean, uh, you're you're gonna say that. Well, we don't we don't have we don't have the information because they're they're lacking the study, but um, maybe we should study it, but. Um, right. We don't. But we don't need. But if we don't, we don't need to study it. But we should study it. And if we don't, you know, hey, we good. So, 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 wow. 
So, Doc, let, let me ask this question. So, what kind of pushback pushback are you getting from the medical community? Well, you know, I, you know, it's the pushback are from this, number one, the surgeons who perform the amputations, right? right. Oh, is there an amputation lobby? Now, let's break this down, y'all. Let's, wow. let's, let's keep it 100, as they say, in, in, in certain circles, right? So, the problem is that there are people who make a lot of money mm -hmm. from doing things that are not appropriate. There's a Civil War medicine lobby. You, you know, there's a chop black people's feet off lobby, like the Kunta Kente method. Let us, we take off your limbs because what is the educational attainment of some of these patients that they take off your limbs? Wow. Fortunately, 58 grade. So if I walk into a room with a white coat and say, yeah, man, we're taking off this foot. That's it. That's all they know. That's all the patients know. Because that's been happening. They know that's happening. And so they'll take off the toe today. They'll take off the end wow. tomorrow. And then they'll take off the knee. They'll hold the knee. They comes in stages, and there is reimbursement for that. And and you know, guess what's not needed? You do not need to have approval before an amputation. But if I want to go save a leg, I need to ask for approval. Right. What? Yes. And and yes. what? Yes. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Sir. Yes, sir. You have to go and ask the insurance for approval. But a surgeon who wants to take off a limb does not need to have approval. So some of the guidelines, wow. some of the recommendations that we propose and initiatives, is that we form a group whereby you should not reimburse reimburse patients who are going to have an amputation without an appropriate arterial evaluation by a vascular specialist who knows what he or she. And that's how you change the incentive. Because you can't chop off until you check first. No, we, we need checks and balances. Because these, because apparently these chop off lobbies seem to be pretty powerful. They are very powerful. Hospitals, you gotta understand. And, and, and you know what's crazy about this is hospitals lose money actually by doing amputations. You know, the hospital, if you oh. think about it, a patient who loses their limb, you lose your limb, you have to go home and figure out how to uh, you know, your cost of medical and non-medical expenditures, you know, the real... Oh, but you have all these other industries that are built around it. Right, so there are other industries that are built around them, too, that you have to lobby against. There's the certain shoe lobby. There's the, there's the, 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 the artificial limb lobby. There's, wow! Yes, sir. Despite the fact that most amputees have never had successfully fitting for a prosthesis. Medicaid in this what? state does not pay for prosthesis. Right. Medicaid does not pay for prosthesis. Oh, it's deep. It's, it's deep. deep. It got deep. So, got deep so, so, right. so it would seem to me we're deconstructing, we're deconstructing a, 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 a complex. A very a, complex. A, a complex, Preventable. ruthlessly <laughs> complex. But, um, uh, diabolical, Mm. Medical mm. get over. But Congressman, it seemed like it seemed it's like, a get over. It seemed like we're gonna have to get the FOI to protect this brother. <laughs> because it, it seemed to me like the lobbies kind of, they're like, yo, you trying to make us lose money. Right. You're gonna make a lot of money chopping people's limbs off. No, he's gonna yeah. have no he's gonna have the breath and weight of the United States government behind him. Well that's mm. the yeah, so that so you we, know we, as, as you, we you gotta go to at it. I tell people you have to have a reason for an OI in life and, and, and be ready to pay whatever price it is as long as as long as you know that you know, every patient that loses their limb is someone's mom, brother, sister, right. cousin, father. Right. So I look at my parents, both my parents are diabetics, and they live in in Philadelphia, in, and in South Jersey area. So if they were to present to their doctor, and they said, no, we have to chop off your limb, how would you, I feel about that? Mm, now, let's right. put you in that situation. And right. the congressman is another example right. of someone who, you know, has had challenges and fortunately has had great access to quality care. Right. Some right. of these patients just lack the information, number one, and number two, they lack quality care. And, that, and, that, and, that, and that's why the congressman is fighting on this front. What he said last yeah. month was, is he wanted, you know, somebody on Clinton Avenue to have the same kind of care that the congressman received Absolutely. in the United Absolutely. States, and we've got that's to fight why, to make sure that that's why I'm doing this because that's his wife. You know, every I mean, when when I had my initial issue with my right foot, and it looked bad, the doctor looked at me and said, "We're going to do everything we can to save your foot." Hmm. And what happens to the kid? Like I said, 
that shows up at the hospital on a Saturday night. Right. Who kind of had my diet and doing what I was doing, but gets there and the doctor looks at him and he's rushing through the emergency room and says, well, your foot's got to come off. Right. Everybody should have what was told me told to them. I'm right. going to try to save it. Now, in yeah. full disclosure, my, my, my father's diabetic and went through really the exact same thing that you're talking about. The only difference was my mom worked at the VA hospital for many, many years. She has great insurance. And went through doctor after doctor in the South saying, we gotta cut, we gotta cut off your foot. We might have to cut off your leg up to the, up to the knee. We might have, and doctor after doctor. They thought that they had exhausted. We had family discussions. We thought, you know, and then there was this one doctor that happened to be in this like high level clinic down in Atlanta, a high level hospital in, in Atlanta. And it was like, wait, come in here. This is expert doctor. And he was like, nah, you don't have to cut it off. I'm a vascular specialist. And he's like, I can open up the, I can open up the, the, the artery, right? right. And the, I thought it was like some cutting edge new thing. Right? I thought, I thought it was like, wow, you just found some cutting edge new. And, uh, and what makes it like wild is that before he got that option, there was like a little conversation and it was like insurance came up and mom mentioned her federal government insurance, which is fly. It's like Cadillac insurance. It's nice. Right? right? If you work for the federal government, right? right. You, your insurance is nice. They looked at the insurance. It was like, well, you got a procedure. Wow. 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 And, and, and that and and what you said was very powerful um, because for those who don't realize, you know, in Mississippi that number is ninety percent, but nationally, fifty-four percent of patients who have no vascular procedures performed the year before any amputation, meaning that they've seen doctors, and those doctors just want to take off without giving the leg a fighter's chance, not realizing that if once a patient loses that limb or their their feet, the patient suffers multiple complications, stroke heart attacks, death is one of them, right? Lack of healing at the stump site, depression, chronic pain. We're talking about pain issues now in our, in our country. Right. Loss of productivity. These patients are young who could have been productive to society. Right. And they're wondering why they're not productive and loss of wages, not only for themselves, but the family members who have to exactly. quit their jobs to take yeah. care of them. Doc, I wanted, you to, I wanted you to comment on that, how it impacts the rest of the family yeah. Because they have to weigh in yeah. so heavily on this family member. The lifetime cost of taking care of one of these patients who loses their limbs is about five hundred thousand mm. dollars. Now, what is the average uh, uh, average income of a Mississippian, for instance, is thirty six thousand nine hundred. Right. What's the average income of someone who lives in in Newark, you know, so someone who lives in Camden. You have to look at you have to look at the totality of this picture. Someone who lives in the Indian Health Services, right. um, you have to look at what the cost not only to these patients but to their family members. Uh, these you know Medicare only covers someone to, to to stay in a nursing home after you lose your limb just for 99 days. After 100 days, you you are presented with two options: you either pay the cost per day after 100 days, or you give up your house. Right. You know, they take over, they take over the house, wow. and whoever lives on yep. the house has wow. to pay rent. Right? Yep. I, I didn't even realize all this until I moved down here. I'm like, wow. this is insane. Mm -hmm. Right. And it becomes and, so, and it's and it's standard operating procedure. So so we've gone from health inequality. Now we have income gaps, and we have right. I mean, you look just because look of your health inequality, you no longer uh, own a house. It's all the thing you're about to pass it's, down it's, no longer exactly. is there. Exactly, and then now we're we're looking at generational impact, and and so just we're caught in this inescapable network of mutuality when it comes to this disease burden. You know, what affects where what affects one affects all, and it has a ripple effect on not only the members but also communities, and the financial burden to our economy affects everyone on this call today. We're all taxpayers, right? And so, uh, seventy five percent of that burden is. A, of that two four hundred billion dollars that I mentioned is taxpayers. <laughs> so you we all need to get pissed, knowing that ninety percent of all this could be prevented if we develop a PD comprehensive program. We screen early, we educate communities, we inform people, and so that they can catch this early, and then we have policies in place to stop and disincentivize bad behavior. 
looking at other models that have currently worked in the past. There's a VA program that has worked in the past where they prevented amputations of veterans everywhere. It's called the PAY program. That has worked in the past. Let's use that. So, there, so, there been, so we know how to do this. It's not yeah. like, like when, I'm, when I'm thinking, my mom's talking about this brand new cutting edge surgery. I'm thinking, this brand, wow, this is brand new cutting edge. This is, this is some Star, Star Trek stuff, right? Stuff that wasn't supposed to exist for 20 years. And what you're telling me is that, yeah, man, this, it's, like a, it's like being a plumber. Yeah. Like you were like you were like this is like not this is not rocket science type surgery. The rotor, rotor, unclog the pipe. Yeah. This is not the brain surgeon. Right, absolutely not. Absolutely wow. Not. And, and, and and to 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 Congressman Payne Jr.'s credit as well in his office um, and his his staffers. I mean, um, you know, I I always say this when I meet him uh, because when I met him, I kind of did some research um, and. One thing that's fascinating, you know, I was born in Nigeria and Africa. I came to the States when I was young. I was 13 and a half. And one of the leading advocates on education and eliminating injustices, in, especially around the Sudan and Western Sahara, was Congressman Payne Sr., um, who was actually, you know, for people who don't know, um, the first African-American congressional delegate to, from New Jersey, right? So people don't realize that this now has become his task and his life <coughs> and 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 why it's because that's just his moral fight that's who he is that's his cloth and um we need more people to come and it's a bipartisan effort um there they, you know this affects everyone um uh, because of just not only the clinical the economical but the human impact that it has yeah. so that, and you know the pad caucus uh as dr truck already said uh to create a caucus in the congress you need a member of both parties. Mm. And uh, we've been fortunate uh, to have, which is interesting, um, Congressman Bill Arrakis from Florida, who is also a second generation congressperson. His father was a member of Congress uh, before him. He succeeded his father in Congress, and I've done the same thing. So we've come together on um, several issues um, bipartisanly. And uh, he's just a great individual to work with. We've also been very fortunate as I've been really pushing this. And I was able already to get funding for the PAD caucus uh, in the Congress, which is phenomenal. Now, what is the delegation from Mississippi? Like, are you working with the delegation from Mississippi? Like, the, the both the senators, the Republican and Democratic senators and congressmen people there? No, not yet. Um, I have, I have um, primarily gone out to the uh, Congressional Black Caucus. And I'm starting there because, you know, obviously we, we have the same common interests, right. you know, uh, representing the same uh, people and issues across, across the country. country. So it was very easy to start there. Uh, but Benny Thompson from Mississippi is very interested uh, in what we're doing and uh, he's weighed in 100%. Uh, I'm just delighted, you know, Barbara Lee who was on appropriations was the person I went to to talk to her about this. She has done a lot of work in going, she was going to Cuba before I went, so she got very excited. She was actually the one that wanted me to go to Cuba about my foot when I initially had my issue, because she knew of the work that they had done down there with this drug, a hepro P. So she was pushing me for two years Donald, you need to go to Cuba, you need to go to Cuba. So we kind of killed two birds with one stone this year. Um, me trying to bring awareness to these doctors that had no idea right. of what they were doing down there and to take some people um, that well, I really just met Dr. Faccaretti but was so impressed with what he was doing that when he decided that he wanted, to, he was very interested in seeing it, I was just delighted. And we have several other doctors um, that are just phenomenal. Our base group is phenomenal. The people that I'm working with that uh, went on this first trip are, 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 is, are amazing. I have a great nephrologist who is, I mean, not only is he a great nephrologist, but his spirit and his soul, um, um, we've connected you know, on a level like that. This young man is like a, a little brother to me and, and, and is just like just, made he, he he keeps me going mm -hmm. i need to help him do what he needs to do in order to save people 
when is the earliest that we could pass legislation on this federally? Because I know there's a lot of stuff going it's, on in Congress. It, it's going to take a while. We're, 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 just, we're, we're just crawling. We're just, we're just getting started. But we can, I, can I make a comment regarding sure. that? Um, I, you know, and, and, and Congressman Payne will speak to the congressional aspect and the voice, but what we just did this last hour, um, I don't think has been done actually in a lot of forums, a lot of platforms, and y'all have a voice, and that voice needs to, you know, just, that's how the, the cancer a campaign started. Someone got pissed off and scattered to their mm -hmm. friends and said, hey, well, how can we help right. out? And let's just speak on this. Awareness, awareness. Let's, let's, let's bring our celebrity friends, whoever you know who has a voice, right. to educate them. And I think in doing so, uh, because by the time we wait for legislation, what, 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 what legislation cannot do, you know, is when it comes to, you know, certain things that are currently happening as we're speaking, amputations are still going on. Right. We have an aging population, the fastest growing population in America, uh, oxygenarians, people in their 80s. Right. These are the people who are going to be coming to our offices with complaints. And so by the time we get to them and we come up with policies, I think that's just one, you know, one, one pillar of it. The other, the most, the, I think the most powerful pillar is what we just did this hour. Right. People need to hear, people need to get you know, get concerned, say, hey, doc, I need to take off my socks next time I come to your office. Right. I need to check me for this thing, this doctor called PAD. Absolutely. Um, if you think you have more symptoms, I need to, I need a second opinion. If you're told you need your, your limbs chopped off, right? Um, I need, if I'm a diabetic, I need to get screened, not only for my eyes, not only for my kidneys, but my legs. Um, our healthcare system needs to be challenged as to things that we need to do to screen patients early on. Um, and also, we just need more doctors here in underserved areas. You know, Mississippi right. has the lowest number of physicians per capita. We need other docs to come and help me out. And other, and other doctors, you know, Georgia needs it, you know, uh, Alabama needs it, Louisiana needs it. To be the voice for the voiceless, people need to do so. So that, that's my, my, my answer. And, and, well, and Doc, this is, uh, it looks like this is um, part one. Right. Yes. Of, of a conversation. <laughs> Absolutely. This is just Absolutely. part one because we need more than the hour. But we want to thank you for all you do. You know, you know, I love you, brother. And, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're on a, we're well, on doc, a mission. Yeah, I learned well, doc, so let, much in this hour. Well, well, well let you. me say this, Doc. Add my love to the congressman's love. Right. Because, no, brother, we, we appreciate you, man. And, you know, and I know I thank the congressman for his hour. Well, ask yeah, him. congressman, we got to find another way to get him back. Got to ask him what, a question. what, is, what is Oh, the, that is yeah, true. Question. I got so caught up in this, I forgot to ask yeah, you Doc, the question, question that we you. ask of everybody. <laughs> you about to join the the ranks of Jesse Jackson because we forgot to ask him. Right, out of all of the people who right. been on the show. Exactly. Remember he was Jackson on twice, was, and we forgot to ask him both times. Yeah. Okay. So, but you weren't rhyming, so there's no excuse. So, um... This is All Politics on Local America's number one, number one, number one political hip-hop radio talk show. So, who is your favorite hip-hop artist, individual, or group? Ah, tough one, but my favorite um, artist, uh, alive or dead? It's an interesting uh, anyone, question. anybody. Uh, yeah, I still go, Pac is still my favorite, Tupac is still my favorite uh, artist, uh, um, number one. Yeah. And number, number two uh, is Jay-Z, number three, Rakim, uh, number All four, right. Biggie, and number five, I'll put Nas in there. All right. All right. Wow. They're like, look, I'll put Nas in there. <laughs> Jay-Z, definitely. Nas, he'll, he'll get there. He'll get there. No, that's cool. Well, Doc, what, what we've got to do is, is we're going to talk with the congressman. We definitely got to get you back. Yes. And we definitely got to find a way to get you everywhere, you know, uh, particularly using some of our contacts, you know, to get you at Essence. We we need to contact some people because you need to be in one of those lectures out there. You know, right, Essence Fest. At Essence Fest. Right. You need absolutely. to do a TED Talk. Absolutely. Absolutely. True. Um, you, you know, need to you, do you a have TED my talk. commitment. You have my time. I mean, that's the, that's the one thing that I, I definitely drop everything for is to raise awareness. So, truly appreciate this forum and I truly love y'all and I appreciate that's the love. Fun. I need to come, have, come back and talk more hip hop. I, 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 uh oh. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. We can do that too. Are you, are you, are you, are you know. So, well, you, yeah, well, 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 you know, you, you, yeah, that's right up the congressman's uh, alley right there. So, right, that's what's up. That's what's up. So, All we'll right. get you in. Jay Z is one of his favorite artists, too. That's right. Uh, that's, that's nice. That's nice. Okay. Is he truly the first billionaire, though? That's a whole nother debate. <laughs> <laughs> Who forgot about Dre? That's right. <laughs>
right. All right. All right, Doc. Thank you so Take much. Care, man. And right, thanks. I learned a lot. All right. God bless. Take God bless. Care. All right. So, and I think we reached the end of the pain report. Uh, Congressman Payne, is there anything else that you'd like to say before we uh, leave? I, for, I mean, I personally, before you even speak, I'd like to say thank you. Yeah, uh, for bringing him on, and thank you for sharing, yeah. right? Because you opened up your own personal health conditions to better educate everyone, and I learned tonight. Absolutely. Yeah, I, you know, I uh, had the great fortune uh, last Saturday to speak before 600 uh, African American women at uh, Beth Israel's and Women's Health Forum, and um, I was um, interviewed by Tony Yates of Channel Seven News, and we had a conversation. And I told my story, uh, you know, how I started out at City Hall, um, drinking five of these a day and not doing what I needed to do. Right. And, and here I am today. And uh, those women were shocked. But mm. to a woman, I, nine, ten of them came up to me and said, you know, you just changed my life. So, you know, that's what it's about. That's nah, what it's about. Man, I, I had to tell you, man, I appreciate you, my brother, because had had. I'd known you when my father went through this because they, you know, they wanted to amputate his leg yeah. and, you know, they told him that would save his life right. and he ended up dying because he wouldn't let them cut off his leg because yeah. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. he just couldn't see himself living with it. Right. But based on what the doctor said was, is that they don't need approval to cut off your leg. Right. They need approval to save it. They need approval to save it. Right. 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 So, just, yeah, this this is a conversation that we have to continue. My father was 68 years old, man. Right. That's not right. Right. That's not right. And you talked about that story so many different times, right? right? Like, oh, I've known that for over 20 years, right? Like, for, well, almost 30 years now, right? Yeah. Like, aging both of ourselves. But, you know, <laughs> a, that is a story that you tell often, right? Like, yeah. about how your father, like, died based on health care. Yeah. I was at based the hospital. On he told me that. I'm there at the hospital with him, Congressman. And, and, and he says to me in bed, he says, they're telling me if they don't cut off my leg, I'm going to die. And he said, I'm, I'm not going to let them cut my leg off. Because he had thought about all of the other collateral things that were going to come behind it, right. like the doctor just said. Right. He said, think about right. all, everything that comes behind it. Somebody's got to take care of him, right. right? He can't go to work no more, right. right? And we're talking about someone who was 68 years old, worked 30 years of his life on one job. And also the understanding that, like we know now, that often when that happens, the life expectancy ends anyway. So well, it was choosing quality. Right, right. that's what the doctor said. Oh, right. You know, right. Um, the average is five years right. after your leg is amputated, and and you know it's 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 always it's always progressive too. It's like you know, well, it's two toes, and then right. well, the other three toes have to go, and then it's half your foot, then it's to the ankle, then it's below the, the knee. knee then it's above the knee, and then you're So you just take right. it all once piece you by start, piece? I have never seen a situation where once they start cutting, they stop. Right. Wow. Wow. Until they get under the knee. Wow. wow. You know? Wow. And it's always a progressive. And is that is that a way to make money? Send them back. Cut this off, man. Mm. Send them home. Cut it's not about off. the care. It's about the comeback. Yes, Roxanne. I, I, I got to say this to you, my brother. You, you've done some great shows with your show. Mm -hmm. Right. You've had some great guests. This one, my brother, damn near bring tears to my heart. Right. Oh, let me right. tell you, and, and we, it was we, your idea. Yeah, amen. It was your idea. No, nah, bro. Now, now we're talking about it, though, man. I, you know, this one touched me, man, because I'm saying this brother is so valuable, man. You know, right. and and since we're keeping it a hundred, yeah. Y'all don't know how sick I've been over the last four years, and even on these shows where, you know, at times when, oh, uh, you know, I couldn't make the show. It was because I. I couldn't do it. Wow, man. Wow. I couldn't do it. Wow. But like, like I remember it, once, but, you're right. You know, I, I mean, I I feel so much better now since I've gone on dialysis than I have in four years. Wow. Huh. I mean, you have to be able to tell my energy is, right. you know. Right. No doubt. Those, Absolutely. Those, man, those four years, brother, no joke. We, we've got to do part two, yeah. part three. Uh, this this I'm glad, Congressman Payne, that you've committed to doing making this ongoing and an ongoing conversation well, brother, about health. You know, you know, it's, it's your have. show, brother. So anything you want to do, 
anything we can do or whatever we want to do. I mean, even even if you want to take your show maybe, in the maybe community. Maybe this will become the pad show. Hey, that's right, all right, we'll do. Right. <laughs> and, and it's your help. thing, brother. But we, we, we run over time. It was, it was yeah. worth it because this has been, yes. I mean, I learned. As I said, I learned some stuff I didn't know before. Mm -hmm. But uh, this is uh, All Politics Are Local.